and it's now time for question time. Members will be aware that as part of the phase resumption of question time, only listed questions will be asked to ministers. Topical questions have been suspended for today. Members asking a listed question will be afforded an opportunity to ask a supplementary question. I will keep the timing under review and I may call other members uh, who are rising in their places should sufficient time uh, remain during the period. We will begin now with questions to the Executive Office and I call Jonathan Buckley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Question number one. And with your permission, I will answer questions 1, 6 and 11 together. Significant work has been undertaken by officials to date on the delivery structures for the Victims Payment Scheme. However, important issues remain to be resolved, including the designation of an executive department to exercise the administrative functions of the board on the board's behalf, the source of funding for the scheme and the clarity on how exceptions are to be interpreted. A series of discussions have taken place with officials and relevant civil service departments in relation to the administration of the scheme. This work is ongoing with further discussion on this to happen this week. Security of funding of the scheme has not yet been confirmed. The executive agreed to release an additional 2.5 million in it to, or to advance necessary preparatory work for the scheme. There is a shared view that, the West, that Westminster has an obligation and must deliver on its responsibility to support funding for the scheme and efforts are continuing to resolve this issue as swiftly as possible. The First Minister and I have made it clear that we are committed to addressing all of the outstanding issues. The Westminster regulations came into force on the 29th of May. Further time, however, is still required to deal with each of the outstanding issues and establish necessary arrangements for the operation of the scheme. I know this is deeply disappointing for many victims and survivors who need the support and we share that disappointment and we'll work to do all that we can to get the scheme delivered as soon as is possible. I call Jonathan Buckley for supplementary. I welcome the additional allocation of 2.5 million for the, from the Executive Office in relation to the pension, our Victims' Pension Scheme. Though despite this, many innocent victims and their families remain deeply concerned by the Finance Minister's comments on the 30th of June in which he suggested if for some reason that this decided not unspent, that the money would be surrendered back in the monitoring round. Can the Deputy First Minister assure those innocent victims and indeed the wider public who are rightly cynical about her intentions at this time that she will not impede nor frustrate the rollout of a victim's pension payment and can she also provide an indication of timescale? I uh, thank the member for his question and I can assure the member and, and all those um, victims that have been anxiously waiting for this scheme for far too long that everything that can be done to have an appropriate scheme in place is being done and we're working our way through the detail. I'm sure the member himself can accept the fact that there is a lot of ambiguity around the detail. We don't have uh, confirmation of funding um, from Westminster and that's significantly important because the scale of what is being proposed is actually so significant that there has to be due diligence done in terms of the executive's um, department and our role in all of that. So there's a lot of ambiguity around uh, the detail of uh, what has been proposed. Um, as I said, we're working our way through the detail of all of that. But for the record, um, let me be very clear, I want to see a victim's pension scheme paid in place for all those people that have been injured as a result of the conflict. I call Paula Bradley for supplementary. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Deputy First Minister for answers thus far. Um, in your original answer previously there, you had stated there were issues yet to be resolved, and one of those was the uh, designation. And given that the Justice Minister has said that she would step in and oversee it, why have we not yet seen a department uh, designated to roll out this scheme? So you're right, the Justice Minister has written to both myself and the First Minister advising that, um, that should the Executive Office decide that that department would be willing to administer um, the scheme and that she would take that work forward. Whilst the designated department is yet to be agreed, uh, DOJ Compensation Services have agreed to assist um, TEO at um, official level with a number of key tasks, including key process requirements, potential staff and structures, data management, including the development of, data protection, of a data protection impact assessment and privacy notice and a review of the draft um, application form. So there's still an awful lot of work to be done in terms of developing a scheme that actually looks after all those that need a payment. Orlea Flynn is not in her place. Moving on then, I call Gemma Dolan. Gourmet August, uh, quest Everett Doe. 
I can assure the Assembly that the Hart recommendations will be implemented fully. The Historical Institutional Abuse Redress Board has been established and open to applications on the 31st of March. That's ahead of schedule and it has made awards of compensation and I commend the dedicated work of the Board and the staff led by Mr Justice Colton during the COVID-19 restrictions. The competition to appoint the statutory commissioner for survivors of institutional childhood abuse recently um, launched and the closing date was the 3rd of July and it's anticipated that the commissioner will be appointed in late summer. Work is progressing on those heart recommendations that not require legislation and these include the issues of an apology, a memorial, provision of services and engagement with the responsible institutions on contributions to the redress scheme. For supplementary. And I thank the Deputy First Minister for her answer, um, specifically in relation to the redress scheme for victims and survivors of historical abuse. Can the Minister provide an update on the quantum of applications to the scheme to date? Yes, the, the board itself opened for applications on the 31st of March and some seven weeks later the first compensation payments were made within the time scale that was set out by the President. This was a significant milestone for victims and survivors who are now starting to receive the compensation they are long overdue. As of the 21st of June, 199 applications had been received, 70 heart and 129 non-heart applications. Of these, 149 were online applications. We're very grateful to the President of the HIA Redress Board for the continuing prompt assessment and payment of applications and those solicitors and groups who are supporting applicants. Encouraging that even in this difficult time with all the COVID-19 restrictions, applications are still being completed, submitted and assessed. Moving on, I call William Humphrey. Deputy Speaker, question number three. <clears throat> with your permission, last can call you, I'll ask Junior Minister Kearney to answer this question. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, since the launch of the Strategic Framework document in 2016, and with extensive community consultation, work has progressed to help create stronger communities and relationships, promote greater health and well-being, and also help create safe, shared spaces and facilities. There's a very strong and vibrant integrated local reference group with broad community representation from across Ardoyne and Ballysillon. Currently, there are 11 community-led revenue projects in the North Belfast urban villages area, and these demonstrate high degrees of cross-community partnership and good relations activities, with a particular focus on important local themes, including mental health and well-being, pathways to employment, building local advocacy and capacity, and also nurturing youth aspiration and leadership. In addition, 13 primary schools and three post-primary schools in North Belfast have also achieved School of Sanctuary status in recognition of the work of these schools in providing safe, welcoming and inclusive places for children and in particular newcomer pupils and also their families. There are also 19 capital projects. Eight of these projects have been completed and a further three have moved to construction. These are the Sacred Heart Parochial Hall and the Grace Family Centre with the contractors due to go on site shortly to begin the Public Realm Improvement Scheme at the Crumlin Road and Liganeel Road Junction. In addition, the community response intervention work of local groups in Ardoyne and Ballysillan has been very well regarded for its cross-community cooperation and also its partnership working. I call William Humphrey for supplementary. The junior Minister for his answer and I commend Lindsay Farrell and her team at Urban Villages for the work they're doing and I hope that work will continue. Mr Deputy Speaker, given the Deputy First Minister's reckless and arrogant behaviour over the last week, having ignored her own and medical scientific advice, broken COVID regulations, caused great hurt to bereaved families, should the Minister would do, do what any self-respecting person the Minister would do in any other jurisdiction, consider her position and resign? The supplementary question should be connected to the original question. I will pass that to the Minister if she wishes to respond. I call Keith Buchanan. Or please. 
The new decade new approach document contains a wide range of proposals which, taken together, constitute an ambitious and very challenging package of measures to be taken forward. There are over 200 proposals and they include major transformation programmes in education and in health and in social care, as well as significant infrastructure projects and cross-cutting recommendations. For example, in relation to the housing provision, climate change and childcare. Whilst the management of the response of the COVID-19 pandemic has been the Executive's number one priority over recent months, some of the NDA proposals are already being progressed at a departmental level, such as implementation of the Redress Scheme for Victims and Survivors of Historical Institutional Abuse, and work to legislate in respect of rights, language and identity matters, which are being advanced through our own department. Looking forward, the Executive will soon have the opportunity to consider the totality of the NDNA proposals as it moves to bring forward a new programme for government, which now also needs to incorporate robust COVID-19 recovery measures for key sectors and in the context of available resources for the new financial year. Call Keith Buchanan. Thank you and thank the Minister for answer so far. Just I would like the Minister to give an update on the House in regard to additional police numbers that was talked about in that document and where we're at and obviously the lack of vision of police on the streets as we, we've currently seen recently. Maybe an update on that would be interesting. Thank you. Well, I couldn't give the member an update in terms of the, the police numbers. Um, obviously, all of the NDNA commitments, I think, probably in some way have all been stalled because of the response to COVID and the, the efforts there. But in terms of uh, recruitment of additional police numbers, um, we can refer that to the relevant, if it's the policing authority or however, make sure that you get that um, information. Moving on, I call Claire Bailey. Thank you. Question number five, please. identity, culture and tradition is currently being concluded. We would anticipate that a final report would be submitted later this month and we look forward to receiving that report and considering all of its findings and recommendations at that time. I call Claire Bailey for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. This commission it was established really in an attempt to move forward on issues that could not, I suppose, garner political support um, at the exec level at least. Um, can the Minister provide any assurances that when this costly and long overdue report is finally received, that the political will to implement its recommendations exists? So, in line, I'm a wee bit confused because the last question asked me is supplementary. Is it for the junior minister to answer that question? It's for it is. Okay, okay. go ahead. Well, yes, the member is correct. Uh, this particular piece of work was commissioned in 2016. Uh, then in December 2018, the Commission made a decision to scale back on its meetings, uh, awaiting a changed political context. We, we now do have an indication from the uh, Commission that it is bringing forward all of its recommendations. The expectation is that that will be with the Executive Office before the end of this month. And then it will be brought to the attention of the uh, First and Deputy First Ministers for consideration at that point in time. You'll be aware that there was extensive uh, community engagement in relation to this piece of work. Twelve public meetings were held right across the, uh, the region. And it's believed that there were up to a thousand people involved in participation in relation to sharing their views in relation to all of these issues. These are very contentious issues very, very challenging. It's important that this piece of work, uh, when it is brought forward, is uh, taken in context with the likely cross-cutting issues that will arise for other departments. But importantly, uh, given the extensive remit of the Commission, it's likely that the actions that flow from it will also dovetail with the Office of Identity and Cultural Expression. Uh, therefore, I would hope that it would act as a platform to inform that particular piece of work uh, going forward. And I hope that information is useful for the member. Moving on, I call Catherine Kelly. Cash to shout, question seven. The majority of requirements on the implementation of the protocol are reserve matters. However, the agri-food requirements fall within the executive's devolved competence and DERA are working intensively to ensure that these obligations are met. We remain committed to doing all that we can in relation to the protocol to secure the best possible outcome for our citizens and businesses and the least possible disruption to our economy and trade north, south and east, west. 
called Catherine Kelly for supplementary. Minister, thank you for your answer. In light of that, how strong is the possibility of a no-deal Brexit? Well, the member's right to raise the, the concerns about the possibility of a, of a no-deal Brexit, and it would, as we all know, represent a dramatic change of circumstances across these islands. The Good Friday Agreement must be upheld, and there cannot be a hard border on the island of Ireland. For its part, the Executive considered operational readiness at its meeting on the 15th of June, and agreed that a programme of readiness planning should be coordinated across all of the departments. This will include planning for a no, no agreement or a limited outcome from the future relationship negotiations with the EU. This will take into account the fact that the protocol will still be implemented regardless of the outcome of the negotiations. I now call Thomas Buchanan. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Question number eight. The public appointment competition for the Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Childhood Abuse was launched on Tuesday the 9th of June. The competition was publicised widely with advertisements in local and national press as well as communication through various social media platforms. Victims and survivors groups were also notified of the launch. The closing date for applications was noon on Friday the 3rd of July and it's anticipated that the Commissioner will be appointed in late summer. The competition will be conducted in line with the principles and practices of the um, Commissioner of Public Appointments Code, and hopefully that answers that question. I call Thomas Buchanan for a supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that update. Can the Minister give any indication uh, as to any details at this stage as to what powers the Commissioner will have, and whether or not that, that Commissioner will have any legal background or any legal qualifications? Uh, in terms of the powers, that's all been worked out and will all be part of the job description and everything that's been set out in terms of the, the public appointments um, process. I'm glad um, for, for the victims and survivors community that we will actually have the permanent uh, person brought into place because I think that's very important in terms of moving us on to the next stage. There are a number of things that are outstanding which the, the victims uh, want to see addressed and I want to see that happen, so I think we need to ha move on from interim advocate into our permanent advocate. Um, happy to provide the member in writing with the actual detail of the powers and re uh, remit and responsibilities of the advocate itself. I call Colin McGrath. To number nine, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, new decade, new approach contains significant and comprehensive commitments to legacy issues. Um, in terms of the statement made by the uh, Secretary of State on the 18th of March, Addressing legacy issues, the First Minister and I have not made any joint representations in our role as First and Deputy First Minister to the Secretary of State on legacy issues following that statement. However, we do intend to meet him on Thursday of this week, and this is one of the issues which will be on the agenda. I call Colin McGrath. Thank you. Um, the approach outlined by the Secretary of State is an appalling attempt to shut down justice for victims and survivors. Would the Deputy First Minister agree with me that cases must remain open so that advances in policing technology, which could open new investigative and evidential opportunities, can be explored to deliver justice for families? I think it's so important that we deal with the past in a way in which um, we can command the, the, the majority of, of support, and I think the Stormont House Agreement was a way for us to do that. I think that uh, I certainly have my own personal view around, um, political view around the Secretary of State's statement of the 18th of March. I know that you're um, own party shares that um, proposal also, that it, it's so, um, in my opinion, it's, about, it's bad faith in terms of the, the approach that's being taken. What we need to deal with is, is the legacy issues in a way that is inclusive, that is um, respectful of everybody's wants uh, and actually finds a way forward because we don't want to burden um, the children of today with, with the legacy issues. And I call Kiva Archibald. Question 10, please. With your permission, uh, Les Jean Corley, I'll ask Junior Minister Kearney to answer that question. Grimoire, Les Jean Corley, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, funding from the Minority Ethnic Development Fund, the Crisis Fund, the Good Relations Interventions and Urban Villages has been used to promote good relations and to address both long-term and emerging needs of our local minority ethnic communities. Since its establishment in 2002, the MEDF has enabled hundreds of projects and groups to support minority ethnic people. It's worth around £1.2 million per annum. This year, to prevent any disruption to the services during COVID-19, we extended that funding 
to current core funded MEDF recipients for a further 12 months commencing on the 1st of April 2020. And that was designed to give stability to the sector and it has enabled organisations to continue to support minority ethnic people at a time when they need it most. We are ensuring that the crisis fund, currently totalling £100,000, continues to operate, particularly to help the most marginalised, including our refugees and our asylum seekers population. There is a wide range of good relations funding, which, depending on eligibility, may be accessed by minority ethnic groups and projects. And these include the Central Good Relations Fund, which is worth £2.75 million, the District Council Good Relations Programme, worth £3 million, and the Peace Four Programme, for which the Executive Office is the accountable department. And the Building Positive Relations Actions have been allocated approximately six uh, 64 million euros. Through these programmes, we are able to help many groups and projects achieve their goals to the benefit of our flourishing minority ethnic community and to enrich our broader shared society. I call Kiva Archibald for supplementary. Um, and I thank the, the Minister for his response. Um, these are really important projects and work streams. Um, and over the past number of weeks, we've seen very public demonstrations against racism in the Black Lives Matter protests. Um, but we also really need to see systemic um, and structural change to tackle division and discrimination. Um, can the Minister confirm that the Executive remains fully committed to tackling the scourge of sectarianism and racism in all their manifestations? Thank you for that uh, question. Um, so yes, uh, but the starting point is uh, to reference our uh, Together Building a United Community Strategy. And uh, for the members' information, that uh, outlines a vision of a, of a united community, which is based on equality of opportunity, the desirability of good relations and reconciliation, but where everyone can live, learn and work and socialise together, free from prejudice, hate and intolerance. And, and I think the member would agree, and I'm sure all members in the chamber this afternoon would agree, that that is not the lived experience of so many within our society, where uh, there is still far too much direct and indirect discrimination, which citizens experience on the basis of their religious beliefs, their sexual orientation, their ethnicity or their colour. And, and in this day and age, that is a, a reality that we need to try and eradicate. Um, tackling and confronting the scourge of sectarianism and racism within our society, and that needs to be in all of its manifestations, is a challenge facing us all. And I believe that that's going to require a cross-cutting uh, and a collective societal approach. So in so many ways, uh, it requires a whole of government and a whole of society strategic response. And I think that that in turn underlines the importance of the NDNA commitment that would actually, in a very explicit way, see racism and sectarianism uh, addressed in terms of a legal expression, setting uh, uh, those issues into legislation as hate crime. But it also uh, provides us with the option of, of all of our representatives committing to an anti-sectarian pledge. And that's a very important, practical, political, concrete, symbolic uh, position for us to take. So we do need bold uh, representation and leadership from everyone in civic and political life. It's not simply a matter for the executive and for this chamber to, to show that. We need to see strong positions taken against racism, against sectarianism, all forms of intolerance, regardless of the, court, uh, the source. And that needs to be reflected in terms of school life, wider community life in the workplace, and, uh, and of course, from political leaders. And, and I'm confident that uh, myself and other colleagues within the executive and within their power sharing government are absolutely committed to providing that type of leadership. Like it. Moving on, and call David Hildage. Speaker, question 12. At its meeting on the 25th of June, the Executive announced a range of indicative relaxations, which included the resumption of further close contact services such as tattoo parlours, 
from the 6th of July. I'm pleased that this decision was ratified by the Executive on the 2nd of July and tattoo parlours are now permitted to open with effect from yesterday. A range of guidance is available to help businesses to prepare for return to operation, including guidance on making workplaces safer, prepared by the Engagement Forum, COVID-19 working through this together. In addition, the British Government has also produced uh, workplace guidance for close contact services and advice and guidance is also available from the trade and the professional bodies. I call David Hildish for supplementary. <clears throat> thank you, Deputy Speaker, and uh, thank you for the, the Minister's answer so far. Uh, the work of the Executive has been crucial over the last four months, and particularly the guidelines and legislation laws, which have, have been very helpful. However, the Deputy First Minister and her party colleagues have driven a coach and horses through those guidelines and laws by their actions last Tuesday. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister, will she do the right thing and give the public the apology they are owed and stand aside or resign until a full investigation is conducted? Um, I think I've, I've, my position is very clear on the record on this issue. I've spoken in this House yesterday. I will speak again later on today. I've spoken in front of the TEO committee. I've spoken to the media. And I've spoken in the party leaders forum. So I think my position is well rehearsed. I am glad that we're in the position that we are today in terms of lifting the restrictions. I'm glad we've been able to make continual easements on a rolling basis. I hope we can continue to do that into the future, and I will continue to lead us through this. Members, we're ahead of schedule, so I propose opening up supplementary questions for the remaining three questions, and I call Justin McNulty. Cash to tree, Jake. The racial equality strategy provides a 10-year framework for action by government departments and others over the period 2015 to 25. We are continuing to implement the key actions in the strategy, working closely with the racial equality champions and departments and the racial equality subgroups, which officials meet regularly. We have no plans for a formal review at present, but we will continue to monitor progress and emerging issues to inform successful implementation of the strategy. I call Justin McNulty. Notwithstanding previous answers about the TBUC strategy and about the new document and new approach, and that surely should be underpinned by a racial equality strategy, would the First Ministers appreciate that the failure to, to progress the review of the racial equality strategy does little to dispel the notion that equality is not a priority for this executive office and could be construed, particularly given an overzealous approach of police in regard to the Black Lives Matter protests and an, an inconsistency with their approach to other recent mass gatherings, that institutional racism exists here? I think we all have a, work, a job of work to do to make sure that we stamp out um, racism in our society and we all have a job of work to do to, to do everything and that's the responsibility of all of us as, as um, political um, representatives. I think in terms of the racial equality strategy itself and the fact it covers 2015 to 25 and as, as is acknowledged in the strategy um, itself, we're under no illusion about the size and the challenge that's of, of, the, of what we have in front of us in terms of tackling racial inequalities that and that will require time and effort and resource. Um, the racial equality subgroup has been appointed along with the racial equality champions in each department, so that's obviously good, and we're continuing to work closely with them to implement the key actions in the strategy. Also, a review of the race relations order and relevant aspects of other legislation is underway, and a review of the delivery model of the ethnic or minority ethnic development fund is nearing completion, and work is ongoing again with the Department of Education to identify ways in which we can tackle um, racist bullying in schools. We plan to consult on draft um, refugee integration strategy in the coming, coming months and we are also considering proposals for ethnic minority uh, or ethnic monitoring to help identify potential inequalities in any sort of underlying causes and I am very happy to take on board any uh, concerns that the, the, the member has and happy to, to receive them at any time around um, how we can improve things and, and do all that we can collectively to stamp out um, racial inequality. I call Mike Nesbitt. Deputy Speaker, thank you. Before the Assembly collapsed in 2017, the Executive was making great strides uh, in terms of the scheme for Syrian refugees. Uh, I believe, proportionately, we were taking more than our fair share on a UK-wide basis. Uh, I'd be grateful if the Minister could update us on what's happened to that scheme since 2017. Thank the Member um, for um, his question. He's right that in October 2020, 15, we had committed to um, welcoming by December of that year between 50 and 100 refugees under the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Scheme, with the expectation that further groups would arrive on a, on a phased basis. The 25th group of refugees arrived on the 6th of February this year, and that brings the total number 
to 1815. A further group of 93 individuals was due to arrive on the 16th of April, but obviously that's been postponed because of the current situation. This scheme was due to come to an end following the arrival of the 26th group um, and has been consolidated into a new global resettlement scheme. Um, that was announced by the British Home Secretary on the 17th of June um, last year. It also was agreed that we would continue to participate in the new scheme for the next year through the current um, crisis places constraints on all, even though the current um, crisis places constraints on all of this, but it's important that we continue to do what we can. So our officials continue to liaise with the Home Office and the Strategic Migration Partnership on the implementation or implications even of the current crisis and we will consider the potential for continued participation in due course and happy to keep the, the member updated on all of that. I call Jim Allister. How can the Minister talk about equality, be it racial or otherwise, when just this day last week she was demonstrating that she and her friends think they are more equal than others and that they have the capacity and the right to break the very laws that they themselves make? It would not be a good start to equality to subject yourself equally under the law. Um, I uh, breathe equality every day. I believe in equality. I practice equality. I bring it into every aspect of my work every day. Thank you. Moving on, I call Jerry Kelly. Since early March, the management of the response to the COVID-19 pandemic has been the executive's number one priority. Our objective has been to help keep people safe and to support those who have faced real hardship as a result of the pandemic. The extraordinary measures we have had to put in place have worked well, and whilst we must not be complacent, we are now at a key point where attention can begin to shift from purely controlling the public health response towards planning for recovery. Over recent weeks, it has been possible to ease many restrictions, and with the publication of an indicative timeline for further easements, people and businesses can begin to plan ahead. The Executive has started the process of developing a recovery framework which will have a particular focus on achieving effect or effective health, economic and societal recovery. We expect to announce more details about that um, shortly. I call Jerry Kelly for supplementary. I thank the Minister for her answer up tonight. Um, I presume we are in a good place, we're getting into the recovery phase, but has the second wave or a possible second wave been factored until the executive's uh, plans? The risk from COVID-19 remains and none of us want to see a second wave of this um, deadly virus or to be in a position like Leicester or Galicia or Catalonia where restrictions have had to be reinstated. We will be monitoring the impact of the relaxations closely and be prepared to rein uh, reintroduce restrictions if this is considered necessary to control the virus. A key tool in preventing a second wave is the test, trace and protect strategy. This will play a key role in containing transmission as more relaxations are introduced. If anyone is contacted by that service, they must act on the information provided and self-isolate or get tested as appropriate. From the 18th of March, TEO established a COVID-19 operations room or a hub to provide information analysis, information analysis and to raise issues relating to public health services right across the north. The hub coordinates activities across departments and reports to the executive. It's important that the hub remains itself in readiness to deal with any potential further waves and any current, uh, concurrent civil contingency emergencies that may arise. The COVID-19 hub has been scaled down since the 15th of June. A small number of volunteers have been retained to operate on, and on a maintained readiness mode. Work will continue in the coming weeks to ensure preparedness for any future necessary stand-up, with full uh, stand-up test runs provisionally scheduled for the autumn. The Chief Medical Officer has also commissioned a rapid review of the first phase of the COVID-19 pandemic to provide a clear understanding of the effectiveness of the initial and ongoing response and also to capture the lessons learned to improve a response to any future resurgence of the virus. Call Tom Buchanan for supplementary. Pretty speaker. Um, listening to the Deputy First Minister, how do you expect the public to have any confidence in the executive's response to COVID-19 moving forward? After the developments of last Tuesday, when both you and a number of your MLAs blatantly broke the legislation you were part of making, do you not now think it's time to do the honourable thing, apologise to the people for the wrongdoing and step aside until a full investigation is carried out? 
I can assure the member that I take my responsibilities very seriously and I will continue to lead us into this recovery phase of the current pandemic. We need to make sure that we're preparing for whatever comes at us uh, down the road. We need to make sure that we're doing all that we can to make our recovery good for, for all of our people in the time ahead. I call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, as we go forward um, after the response to the COVID-19 pandemic, there's a risk of resurgence and spikes in different parts of Northern Ireland. What preparations are being done to assist businesses in areas where it would be need to be localised lockdowns to, to ensure that they can continue to go through that period of localised lockdown? Um, thank the member for his question. This is one of the things that we have indeed been looking at and considering and planning for, um, whether it is a second wave or whether it is uh, a cluster effect, which um, we have witnessed um, across the world in many areas. Um, I note even today in County Down uh, there was a report that perhaps there is a, a cluster um, there. So I think the, the, the crucial element to us being able to deal with that is the fact that we have a test, trace and isolate um, policy in, in, in place and that, that, that is crucial to um, being able to quickly identify things. One of the things that the Chief Scientific Officer has said to us previously is as we lift all these restrictions and free up um, people to move around a lot more freely. Um, that t because we have the ability to be able to detect cases very quickly, that will be, our, uh, will be a, I suppose a, a tool to help us uh, be able to combat that as quickly as it happens. But you're right, whenever it came to lockdown in, in the first instance, there were supports put in place to help businesses. So we have to consider that as an executive as a whole now around how then can you support businesses if in fact you have a cluster area and closures are are put in place. So that's certainly something that, that, that we need to continue to consider and will be part of our plan on for what potentially comes next. Can I remind members to continue to rise in their place to indicate that they still wish to ask a supplementary? I now call Steve Egan. Deputy Speaker, and thank you very much indeed, Deputy First Minister, for your remarks so far. Um, because you read fairly widely and have taken a lot of advice and guidance, particularly on COVID in the past, and you've looked quite closely at the World Health Organization, the World Health Organization has recently uh, revised its guidance, particularly about sort of gatherings and crowds. Would you care to reflect on that and then give us some answers about what you did last week? I don't see how that's relevant to the question that I've been asked, but I'm happy to say to the member that I um, think that we have to do all that we can to lead ourselves through this period, into this period of recovery. We have lifted so many restrictions each day over the last number of weeks. We at breakneck speed, as I keep um, confirming to people, we need to get back to normality for people. We need to give people that, that freedom. Uh, we said that we wouldn't keep anything in place for one day longer than necessary. I am very sure in my responsibilities. I am very sure in what I need to do, and I am very sure that I will continue to lead us through this crisis. Moving on, I call Pat Sheehan. I got a question 15, that I hope. We have now reached an important point in the COVID-19 pandemic where we are beginning to look beyond the response phase towards the actions that will be needed to affect a robust and sustainable recovery, rebuild public services and restore more normal ways of living. Our approach will be to build on sectoral plans such as the Economic Recovery Strategy, which was published recently by the Economy Minister, to bring forward an inclusive programme for government, which is based on collaboration and joined up thinking, to deliver good outcomes in things that matter most to people. We will continue to develop strong cross-sectoral working partnerships such as that provided through the engagement forum chaired by the LRA and maintain a dialogue with the stakeholders as a basis for strengthening and enhancing societal well-being with our immediate priorities, beginning, or being to get, beginning to get our economy working again, strengthen our health and social care services and then mitigate the immediate societal impacts of the crisis. I call Pat Chin for supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for her answer and I wonder uh, would the Minister agree with me that as a society and as an economy we can't go back to what was there before COVID-19. We must have a society that is just, that is equal, that is people-centred and is inclusive. Um, so it's clear that the COVID-19 pandemic will have lasting and, and profound impacts on society and the economy. And an immediate priority for the executive will be to help our local businesses get through the crisis and get the economy working again. However, that does not simply mean returning to the way things are, were previously. The crisis has allowed us to view things in a different light. It has shown us new ways of working and given us opportunities to explore different technologies and to experiment with alternative working patterns. There is no doubt that the world that emerges out of the pandemic will be slightly different to what, or significantly different to what has uh, gone before. And we need to be ready to grasp uh, 
um, emerging good practice and be able to quickly learn from others so that we can make this a good place to live, to work and to do business. We need to achieve economic growth in a balanced and sustainable way that puts social justice, workers' rights and equality at its centre. And we need to be prepared to look forward rather than back when it comes to societal recovery. But we must also acknowledge with, and, and help with the trauma that people have suffered, particularly those who have lost loved ones. This will be issues that we need to be explored with key stakeholders across all sectors as we start to plan for the recovery and as we bring forward our new programme for government. I call Matthew Toll. Mr Deputy Speaker, one of the most vital aspects of recovering from uh, the, the economic recovery from COVID will be dealing with the effects of Brexit later this year. The Deputy First Minister said earlier on that the Executive Office was doing all it could to protect Northern Ireland from the effects of Brexit, but with respect, there is a culture of silence from the Executive Office. Since this Assembly re reformed, we have had no formal updates from the Executive Office on the delivery of the protocol or broader issues relating to Brexit. It isn't enough, Deputy Can we have First a question, Minister, to please? defer to the ideologues in Whitehall. Can we have, before recess, a specific update on legislation this Assembly will have to pass before the end of the year, and also a plan for engaging with local businesses on what they need to do to deal with the effects of Brexit? First Ministers, we need it urgently. Um, I, I absolutely agree in terms of the fact that Brexit is one of the biggest challenges which we face. And we, as we build an economy, what our, what our businesses are craving, what our people are craving is certainty. And we need to get that certainty. I, I would be very fearful that um, as we move towards the end of the year that we, do, um, that we are still in this space, space where we could potentially have that crash out Brexit, which is obviously catastrophic. Um, we do have the protocol. That protocol must be implemented. It was hard um, fought for. And the executive continues to discuss all of these things, as I said, the implementation of the protocol is the role and responsibility of the British government. Um, but however, the role in relation to agri-food falls under the DERA department here. Um, and so a lot more work needs to be done to give the clarity that's required from our local ports, for example. Um, and we need to continue to engage um, with the sector to make sure that we answer the questions, which people have many of, um, and that we give that, that clarity. Um, and we will continue to engage with the Assembly around all of that and indeed with our own um, TEO committee. Um, the executive itself has had uh, a, few, a number now of um, dedicated sessions on Brexit um, because clearly for the last number of months a lot of focus was on COVID but um, we are very conscious of the fact for some time now that we had to get back to um, dealing head on with the issue of Brexit. I call Paul Bradshaw. Um, Deputy Speaker. Um, um, Deputy First Minister, I'm just wondering, in terms of the economic recovery, what role our universities will play with that, and whether the executive would support the lifting uh, of the cap on student numbers? Thank you. Well, firstly, in terms of recovery, it's going to take all of our effort, just as it did to fight COVID, it's going to take all of our effort to recover. And that means working with all of our stakeholders. If there was some of the positives that I could point to around how we've uh, dealt with the COVID-19 crisis, it has been the work that's been done between business organisations, um, done with, um, with, with the trade union movement, done right across the, the pace. That's been really, really crucially important. I want us to continue that partnership approach. It's actually one of the things that was written into the NDNA uh, deal, that, that, that collaborative approach with society. So if we're going to build, that means working with the universities, the further education colleges, working with all the different um, stakeholders, because we have a huge battle on our hands in the time ahead to build, uh, to build uh, our economy, to make sure that there's employment prospects, to make sure that uh, we tackle all the issues that need to be tackled. And that is the last of our question to the Executive Office. I've asked members to take their ease for, take their ease for a few moments when we will return at uh, a quarter to with questions to the Minister for Health. Uh, questions are not normally taken during question time, so we'll wait until after question time if someone has a point of order. Okay, members take their ease for a few moments.